Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. I'm Vicky at Ethic Learning Team. Before we start, I'd like to let everyone know that there is a chat area in the left corner down at the bottom of your screen where you can see type message here. This is the area where you can see, um, this is the area where you can type in your question or let us know if you are experiencing any technical difficulties. Um, now, can I please have someone to type into that area to confirm that the sound is coming through nice and clear? Oh, thanks everyone. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I will quickly go through some housekeeping matters. Today's webinar will be recorded and uploaded to Avid YouTube channel. We'll send you the YouTube link when it is ready in a follow-up email together with copy of the PowerPoint slides. At the end of the webinar, you'll be directed to a quick survey, which includes a question that allows you to let us know what other relevant topics you want to know more about. So please complete the survey um, at the end of the webinar, and we're very keen to hear your feedback. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A session. And during the, in the course of the presentation, please feel free to type in your questions and they will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers, Michelle Pierce of Social Business Consulting and Paul Brunton from Avid Code Team. Welcome, Michelle. Welcome, Paul. I'm now handing over to Paul. Thank you, Vicky. Yep, my name is Paul Brunton. I work at ACFED as the step, one of the standards and code advisors. Um, my role involves providing advice to members on the financial risk management and governance, governance aspects of the ACFED code of conduct. Um, and as part of my job, I review new member applications and compliance self-assessments of members in those areas, and particularly review policies that members submit on topics that we would broadly call the prevention of financial wrongdoing. As Vicky mentioned, um, we've also got Michelle Pierce, who is the appointed accounting specialist on ACFID's Code of Conduct Committee. Michelle has worked in the international development sector um, over the last 20 years, working firstly in a number of INGOs, and more recently providing consulting services. Michelle led a team to revise the financial wrongdoing sections in the update of the code that we had um, a year or so ago, and has written and implemented many financial wrongdo wrongdoing policies herself. Michelle has recently assisted ACFID in writing a set of guidelines to assist members in developing a prevention of financial wrongdoing policy. Thanks, Paul, and hello, everyone. Um, on the next slide here is an overview of what we plan to cover today. Um, I'll talk about the purpose of the training, then look at how prevention of financial wrongdoing is covered in ACFID's Code of Conduct. Next, I'll hand over to Michelle. We'll go through some definitions before moving on to the steps involved in developing a prevention of financial wrongdoing policy. Then we'll both share some common issues before wrapping up with some, hopefully, some useful resources and a time and time for some questions at the end. Um, I should point out we won't be covering um, cyber security other than through the more general principles of financial wrongdoing. However, if you'd like to have a, a future webinar on cyber fraud and cyber security, please let us know in your feedback for this webinar. Also, um, as we're going through the material here today, if you think of any other topic for the future, you want to dive deeper into some of the areas that we might cover today, uh, also please let us know. Um, and just to mention, um, if you are interested in cyber security, um, CPA Australia's in the Black Magazine um, recently published just a, a pretty good, easy to read article that gives a good introdu introduction to that top topic, um, lists out some of the major threats and the ways to treat them. Um, we've included the link to that article at the end of this presentation. Okay, so what are we here for today? Um, we're here to provide an overview of the sections of the active code that uh, combine to support the prevention of financial wrongdoing. Um, we're also here 
help uh, you um, to develop an update to, oh, sorry, let me start that again. We're also here to help um, you develop or update a prevention of financial wrongdoing policy that would be compliant with the code. And um, also here to direct you to some um, additional resources which will help you around the area of financial wrongdoing. Um, as many of you would be aware, um, ACFID published a new and improved version of the Code of Conduct um, last June, and these sections have been about being compulsory for members since then. But prevention of financial wrongdoing is not a new feature of the Code though, is it Michelle? That's right, Paul. It's actually been a, a general clause on these sort of topics since the inception of the code. For example, we had clauses about conflict of interest and obviously some basic clauses about good internal financial controls right from the start. About 10 years ago, we also beefed up the section on what we called control of funds and resources um, back then. So that's, that's been in the code uh, for the last 10 years at least. Thanks, Michelle. Um, in the current code, there is now a specific commitment at, um, on financial wrongdoing in Quality Principle 8.2. However, financial wrongdoing prevention controls are part of the content in Quality Principle 4, which is quality and effectiveness, uh, Quality Principle 5, which is around collaboration, Quality Principle 7, which is around governance, Quality Principle 8.1 around ethical resourcing and also um, in Quality Principle 9 which touches on people and culture. So how you deal with provincial wrongdoing is really spread throughout the code. Um, how the, um, the code treats financial wrongdoing um, will be set out in the guidelines that we'll publish shortly. And we'll talk a little bit more about those a little later on. Sorry, I'm just trying to get the next slide. Got it. <laughs> just having a bit of house trouble there, sorry. Um, yep, first up, Compliance Indicator 8.2.1 is the specific area of the code that ref references financial wrongdoing, which requires that members can control and manage their financial resources and risk. To verify this, um, we will be looking for you to have documentation, which would be a policy, procedure, or guidance um, that address risk management and control mechanisms. And um, it's usually good when we ask for documentation for you to for you also to send in an extract from your risk register that um, that shows your financial wrongdoing risks or related risks. Um, we're also looking for, of course, um, policy procedures and documents, guidance documents on financial wrongdoing that cover off fraud, corruption, counter-terrorism and money laundering and violation of sanctions imposed by the Australian Government. And it's important that they do specifically cover off in all those areas to comply with the code. Um, we're also looking for uh, documents that include um, a check of individuals and organisations um, against the uh, various prescribed listings um, done by DFAT and AGs. Um, and we're also looking for um, documentation that sets out um, appropriate and effective internal controls. Um, for example, many organisations are, you know, would send in their um, financial man uh, management manual or fin financial procedures um, to demonstrate that they've got controls in place. Um, Michelle, can you tell us some more about the last par paragraph of the statement regarding the requirements for partners? Yeah, I, I can, Paul. There's a few areas in the new code where the Code of Conduct Committee assessed that compliance was significant enough that it should be extended to implementing partners, and this is one of them. Another area is child protection, for example. Um, so that means when we assess compliance with this principle, we expect to see documents that address prevention of financial wrongdoing at the member agency, but we also expect to see that the member has considered similar for their implementing partners. Now, 
what you actually have in place really depends on your own operating model and how you work with partners and field officers, etc. But some examples of the, that sort of documentation might be um, that you require relevant partner staff to do fraud awareness training and you have attendance records of that. Um, you might check members of partner governing bodies um, and staff against the prohibited entities lists. Um, and you might have some requirements around that sort of thing in your MOU or other agreement that you have with your partners. And of course, you also do some monitoring uh, that those requirements are in place. Thanks very much for that explanation, Michelle. Um, look, now we'll move on to um, look at the definitions of some of the key words that appear in this section of the Code of Conduct. Thanks, Paul. So we've got um, some definitions for financial wrongdoing areas in the Code of Conduct. They've either been brought forward from the previous version of the Code or we've sourced them from areas such as legislation, from DFAT and from Transparency International. So firstly, financial wrongdoing itself is behaviour that's illegal or immoral with regards to financial transactions and it includes these areas from ACVID's perspective that we've put in the code. So uh, bribery, corruption, fraud, money laundering, terrorism financing and violation of sanctions imposed by the government. For bribery, which is a subset of corruption that involves the offering, promising, giving, accepting or soliciting of an advantage as an inducement for an action which is illegal, unethical or a breach of trust. Inducements can take the form of gifts, loans, fees, rewards or other advantages. Corruption, as I said, which includes bribery and some other activities, is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Fraud, dishonestly obtaining a benefit or causing a loss by deception or other means. And I know in the DFAT definition they, they make it clear that a benefit can be monetary or non-monetary. Money laundering is the process of concealing the origin, ownership or destination of illegally or dishonestly obtained money and hiding it within legitimate economic activities to make them appear legal. And terrorism financing is intentionally providing or collecting funds and being reckless as to whether those funds are used to facilitate or engage in a terrorist act. Now Paul, I think you've got a couple of examples just of those last two points, haven't you? Uh, yes, Michelle. Um, yeah, so some actual, I suppose, real life examples of how these things play out. Um, around terrorism financing, um, seeing sham organisations, and probably not so much in Australia, but probably more overseas, um, sh sham organisations masquerading as legitimate organisations, and usually pretty well set up with uh, you know good looking websites and Facebook pages and pictures of people in the, um, out in the field. Uh, to lend the air of authenticity, authenticity, I'll say that again. <laughs> Make it look real is what I was trying to say. Um, to, to sort of suck people into donating to them. Um, there's been cases of legitimate businesses um, operating, I suppose, as a bit of a front for terrorist activities. Um, one, I think, in the UK was a money transfer business is operating legitimately but unable to account for um, large amounts which were suspected to be transferred to terrorist organisations. Um, there's also been infiltration of legitimate and well-established charities. Um, for instance, um, people working as collectors for charities um, where the money that they collect doesn't quite make it back to the charity but it's diverted off overseas to a terrorist organisation. Um, and then just the way money is sent overseas by the gym, the charity, charity that, that is then siphoned off overseas by a terrorist group who've set up some sort of other organisation that, again, looks legitimate, um, whether it's um, selling services or whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, money laundering and um, I suppose here we're talking criminals um, as distinct from terrorists, again, sham organisations. Um, how you might see symptoms of money laundering um, could be, and I know I've had one, seen one case, um, just large unexplained donations that turn up. Um, 
also donations not running into pattern um, or not running to usual patterns might be an indicator that something unusual is happening that you might need to look into. Um, I suppose another one was just employees depositing and withdrawing funds from bank accounts without any sort of real explanation. Um, other things are inflated travel claims, inflated purchase prices of goods, which look like attempts by um, people to get money out of the organisation back into their own hands. And, um, and also uh, money just being transferred overseas uh, to financial jurisdictions where it can't be traced, it just disappears. Um, yep. Thanks, Paul. There's certainly a lot to think about with those examples. Um, when Paul and I were developing the, the guidelines to help people with writing their policies, we, w we were trying to think of a way to demonstrate to members um, that you really need to think holistically about the possibilities for financial wrongdoing that exist across your organisation. So we've, we've developed a diagram to try and help with that that's on the next slide. So as Paul mentioned, financial wrongdoing has a specific section of focus in the Code of Conduct, but it really does have a number of touch points across the organisation. So this slide provides a graphical representation of just a few of those areas in, in the activities of a fairly standard INGO, I guess, where there's a potential for financial wrongdoing. Um, so I'll, I'll just list a few of them. So for example, you might have a donor try to give you money, sometimes a large amount of money, as long as that money can get channelled to their own specific pet project, which might not be aligned with your mission and um, might have some uh, illegal aspects uh, relating to it. Um, when you're spending your money with suppliers, um, Possibly a supplier bank account has been set up incorrectly in the system and it might be the money might be getting siphoned off into an employee bank account. Or you might have a related party situation with one of your suppliers um, where uh, the supplier is a sister or a brother or a parent of one of your employees and the contract with that supplier has been set up in a way so it's not a not on favourable terms with the INGO. Um, Another example, when you're paying out money to projects, you might be operating in a country where there's um, a cash economy. Um, so you have to transfer cash into the project and it ends up going to the wrong organisation. Um, another example would be if you're working in a war zone and in order to be able to access your target beneficiaries, you have to deal with some of the participants in that conflict and they require bribes from you to physically Oops, access those beneficiaries. Thanks. <laughs> Just yep. gone a bit too far. So um, the other thing that we've got is some controls around these potential risks. Um, and the, the final risk that we talked about was um, sending money to a partner project and the partner possibly has people on its board that are linked to terrorist groups or terrorist activities. We've suggested for each of those risks some potential controls that you might have in place and we'd expect to see these controls at the policy level but also across a range of other documents. So for example something as broad as your mission statement um, in terms of preventing the the donation going off to a project that doesn't align with your mission. So um, we look at controls like mission statement, ethical receipt of donations policy, having doing due diligence on your projects and monitoring of that. Uh, we look at things like screening, police checks, reference checks of your employees, segregation of duties um, in terms of financial transactions, reconciliations occurring with um, uh, transfers to projects, ideally you'd be transferring electronically as much as possible using reputable banks and asking for acknowledgement of funds receipt. Um, you could have an anti-bribery policy in place, um, anti-bribery training for staff and partners, MOUs with your partners, due diligence 
for partners um, and screening of partner staff and also conflict of interest policies, declarations, etc., reporting on related parties and a solid procurement policy. So um, quite a lot to think about and really important to think about your end-to-end -end funding cycle. So this will go a long way to ensuring that you've got appropriate controls in place at each point in the cycle of money going through your organisation. Um, and I think it's interesting to, with those examples that Paul was talking about a minute ago, to think about how many of these controls might have either prevented or detected some of those issues occurring. So Paul, I think you've got a poll for us now, is that right? That's right. We're going to make everyone a little bit of work that's um, still listening. Um, yep, so we'll get the poll up. Um, so this is all about... Um, how to detect how fraud is detected. And we're probably talking more about fraud here than the other areas of financial wrongdoing. But what do you think is the um, most effective way of detecting fraud out of all those things that are listed there? So I've got internal audit by accident through um, you know, computer controls, external audit, tip-offs by staff, tip-offs by police, management reviews, or surveillance and monitoring. So you can all have a go at um, having a stab at which ones you think are the most effective. And surveillance and monitoring has jumped ahead. I could do a little commentary here while it's playing out. Yeah. Yeah. How are we going? I think we're just about there. So, looks like eight is the most popular surveillance and monitoring. Um, but the answer is tip offs by staff is by a long way the most effective way of detecting fraud. So, that's all about um, having the right culture and the right processes in place um, because staff, your eyes and ears on the ground, they can see what's happening. Um, I think. Things like um, internal audit and internal uh, monitoring and surveillance are the next effective. Um, and interestingly, or maybe not so interestingly, but external audit is uh, one of the most least effective ways in picking up fraud in only about 3% of cases. I think with the staff tip-offs, it's um, around about somewhere up around just about 60%. Um, of case fraud cases that detected through staff, staff tip offs and um, being proven that where there's a, a good process that enables that to happen, that is by far the most effective method of uh, detecting fraud. That's all, and I should say that's all just that, that is all based on actual research as well. I didn't make that all up. Not that I would. Sorry, Michelle, nothing. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Paul. That sort of, yeah. Well, that backs up my experience as well. So, um, I guess so. We've talked a bit about risks and controls, um, but acknowledging that all all agencies are different. So, whilst we can provide you with some generic or suggested risks and controls to help point you in the right direction of of um, how you might go about doing your own risk assessment, it's really important that you, when you start to develop or update your prevention of financial wrongdoing policy, um, that you do a thorough analysis of your own potential risks. So in, in the guidelines that we've developed for ACFID members, we've got a number of steps that we suggest that you go through as an organisation to develop your policy. And the first step is a risk assessment. Um, and you might find it useful to do this with a multidisciplinary work group or by having workshops with people from different parts of your organisation. And I think it's important to consider not just existing risks, but also new and emerging risks that you're aware of. So Michelle, what would you say to members that looked at the list of financial wrongdoing areas and said that they were totally unlikely and wouldn't happen to them and therefore they didn't need to worry about them? Maybe something like tourism financing. Well, I'd say absolutely still have them on the initial list, Paul. It might be that 
once you look at that risk with your working group that you you decide that there's a low likelihood of terrorism financing occurring. So for example, if you only work in one country where there's no known terrorist activity, however, the impact of being involved in terrorism financing, even inadvertently, would still be really high. So the risk assessment is crucial for determining the level of controls to put in place to mitigate what the perceived risk is. And I guess don't forget that with some of the financial wrongdoing areas that you would be covering in a policy, they're not just ACFID code requirements but they're legislated requirements. So, so that one in particular is covered in the Australian Counterterrorism Financing and Anti-Money Laundering Act and the Act itself requires a risk-based approach to be used when designing your systems to prevent these sort of crimes from occurring. So if you're using a risk-based approach and something bad does happen, the evidence of your approach can be used as a legal defence. Thanks, Michelle. So you say the members to one, start their policy with a risk assessment, and two, make sure that they consider all the financial wrongdoing risks. So is that the end of the risk process, Michelle? No, not at all. It's it's um, when we've listed the steps in the policy development process, we started with risk assessment, um, but in practice, you would do this all the way through your policy development process, and it would be happening in parallel with your other steps and informing the other steps. So you should have some sort of uh, feedback loop mechanism in place so you can update your risk assessment based on your learnings along the way um, in terms of the policy development and implementation cycle. Thanks Michelle. Um, and now we've got another, it is, yes, we've got another question for everybody out there. Um, thank you. So this one's all about um, the overall risk rating in Australia that Austrac and ACNC, ACNC um, came up with about a year ago. Um, so this is about what do you think that the risk for the not-for-profit sector is for concerning tourism financing and money laundering? There we go. Well, nobody picked low, and that's not the right answer anyway, so that was a good choice. Um, but the, the answer is medium, um, and medium not because it's extremely likely to happen or anything like that. Um, in fact, I think the likelihood of um, terms and financing and money laundering in, in Australia is, I think, um, I was going to say not that great, but it hasn't been found to be that, that great. But it's the, the impact that, um, that those risks, risks have on the sector should they, um, should they actually occur. Um, so it's the impact on um, charities themselves, the diversion of funds away from charities, and the impact um, charities themselves, the diversion of funds away from charities, and the impact on beneficiaries of those charities when funds are diverted away from them into, um, I suppose, illegal or terrorist activities. And then you've got the reputation risk on, on top of that as well. Um, yeah, so it's definitely top of mind for the regulators as well as, sorry, I'm sure, I'm... for charities. So I think on the next slide, we're looking at our next step. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Yep, I was just trying to work out where I was. Thanks, Michelle. Is that yeah. okay? So again, we've got another diagram to help yeah. organisations think about that risk assessment process um, and we can't emphasise it enough, I guess. Um, do your risk assessment solidly, think of all the funds flowing into your organisation, what controls that you might need for donations. Um, holding your funds in a reputable bank, screening staff, code of conduct training, that sort of thing, reporting incidents, managing incidents, reporting um, finances and risks for management and governance, having some good policies in place around conflict of interest, prevention of financial wrongdoing, whistleblowing risk management, and also when the money goes out to door to partners, 
having doing due diligence, having an MOU in place, monitoring what the partners are doing with the money, um, training, incident reporting, acquittals and audits, and having feedback loops all along the way to inform what you're doing. Um, I think uh, you can identify when looking at these diagrams or doing your risk assessment, you can identify if there's any areas of your operations where controls are weak or non non-existent and might be exposed. Um, yes, and look, you could even um, think about develop developing some scenarios to test your existing controls by running them through your process in the end. Um, look, some examples could be um, having a criminal organisation who's seeking to use your, your organisation to launder the proceeds of crime by making a direct donation, directed donation and then to recover that money by setting up bogus contracts with one of your partner organisations. You have the controls in place that would detect that, for instance. Um, but it, another example could be um, having a board member of a partner organisation who's got associa associations with terrorist organisations and is planning to redirect funds provided by you to terrorists. Or by the more of a fraud side, um, you know, one of your employees is under financial pressures and is using his work credit card to purchase goods for his own use and disguising that as work expenditure. Um, do your controls allow the wrongdoing to be, to be prevented or if not, detected and managed? So the next step in developing your prevention of financial wrongdoing policy is to do some consultation. So we talked about having a, a working group across the organisation and it's really important to engage quite a variety of stakeholders um, in developing your policy to make sure it's robust and effective. Um, and this will help create awareness of potential financial wrongdoing across the organisation which in turn itself is an important strategy in preventing and detecting the wrongdoing as we talked about in that poll question. It also um, it helps people in the organisation put financial wrongdoing in, in their own context, so how it can impact on their work and it builds their ownership of the risk and any strategies to control that risk. So you really need everyone in the organisation and your partners to be your eyes and ears. Um, some key steps in the consultation include identifying your key stakeholders to participate in the development of the policy. Um, as I said, coming from different areas of the organisation, people often think about finance, but really a cross-sectional group of stakeholders is ideal, so involving HR people, program management delivery people, um, fundraising, donor services people, compliance people as well. This group should work together to define the objectives and purpose of the policy for your organisation, have a look at issues that should be addressed within the policy document and also think about the process for developing it. It's really helpful to get people from your governing body involved or possibly an appropriate subcommittee such as your risk or finance committee depending on your own governance arrangements. For a smaller organisation it might be the treasurer that that could be involved in developing that policy with you. Um, also think about where it's possible and practical to engage overseas staff of your organisation and implementation partners so they'll know how the risks of financial wrongdoing play out locally and they'll be aware of their own country's cultural, legal, political and other situational aspects that you need to consider. For example, um, in the Pacific uh, the impact of Wantok where favour is given to family members or in other countries the impact of hierarchy so if fraud is committed with senior by senior people in some countries they can't be reported because their behaviour is always beyond question so it's useful to think about how your policy might play out in different cultural contexts. Then it's also useful to think about um, external Stakeholders, ACFID is a great resource as we've mentioned. Um, also think about people like your bankers, internal and external auditors. Insurers can often be a bit of a gold mine of information because they, uh, they often see when controls break down so they can give you some good case studies and tell you what they expect to see to, um, to provide insurance for you. Um, also reference regulators, funders, affiliates from your international networks are also good 
good sources of case studies and providing support. So this, this consultation helps give you an understanding of good practice in your situation and also potential risks, what your legislative requirements are and support systems and compliance standards. Thanks Michelle. Um, the next step in developing your policy is to do a stock take of what you have in place. Um, the stock take of existing policies and other controls should include a reality check. So what do I mean by that? So it's being aware of what is really happening. Um, discussing the start to test um, the, application, the policy application. Uh, for example, asking people, what would you do if you suspected fraud? Um, try the kitchen test, ask people in the kitchen, do they know that you have a policy at all? Do they, do they know what the controls are that are relevant to them in their job? And do they apply them? And do they understand why they're necessary? Um, are there any gaps or weaknesses? So another thing to think about is whether there's any um, barriers preventing the application of your policies and other controls. An example might this could be if all of your documents are in formal English and they're hard for overseas staff to understand. I, I had one client where um, staff in a particular office asked for a policy to be converted basically into pictures and very simple English so that they could then share, share it outside the finance team with other staff. Um, look at whether people know how to find policies and guidance. You know, are they on the intranet? Uh, um, are they stored somewhere on the server, etc. And particularly make sure that they know how to report. So if if staff chip ops are the main way that um, fraud is is reported, make sure people know how to give you that tip off. Um, are there organisational cultural issues that are providing barriers to to uh, reporting, etc. So for example, if staff experiences that incidents that have been reported haven't been followed through by management, so therefore they're apathetic to reporting any future ones. Yep, and as active members, um, of course we've all got um, processes, in, processes in place to record, track and uh, regular report on our finances and um, this should provide a good start preventing financial wrongdoing, that's you know having good internal financial controls in place. Um, but we also need to think about what else we need to do to put in place um, to address gaps and weaknesses. For example, um, training of staff um, and relevant, training of relevant partner staff. Um, the simplification of key points um, of their financial wrongdoing policies and the flyers and posters, as Michelle was um, outlining before. Um, production material, as that great example Michelle gave about putting things in the pictures of different languages. Um, and making procurement policies and travel policies um, all available on the internet um, so that people can see them and in a way that they can easily um, understand them and have, have, have them to wade through a sort of highly typical, um, I suppose, long document. Um, so, yeah, communication is, uh, is, is very important in that, uh, that respect. Oops, sorry, I was just trying to change the slide again and having mouse failure, or actually failure of my fingers, I should say. Um, yeah, next slide. So we're finally we're going to get on to actually writing the policy um, after all, all that preparation. So you should draft the policy based on your risk assessment, which also reflects your circumstances, such as your size, nature of the, your activity, your functions, program delivery structure, and the country and regions where you operate. Um, for example, if you operate in a complex conflict area where risks of terrorist financing are high, um, I suppose you'd be expected to develop a, a robust policy which would probably feature tight controls over acceptance of donations, would have tight internal financial controls, um, we have detailed due diligence processes for partners, contractors and suppliers. Uh, expected to be staff and volunteers screening against terrorist and criminal records. 
and robust to puddle in project management processes. Um, the policy should also endeavour to establish a culture where anomalies are reported and they'd also provide for education of staff, partners and other third parties. Um, what, we, what we don't expect members to do is just to follow or copy someone else's policy. Um, someone else's policy may not always be appropriate to your organisation or to your circumstances. Uh, I suppose an extreme example would be taking um, a policy of a large multi-million dollar NGO. Um, that would be most likely to be too complex, detailed and much too onerous for a small NGO, say, at the turnover of a couple hundred thousand dollars to implement. Um, for your policy to work for you, it's important to think through your own risks and your own circumstances and the strategies you need to manage those risks. And I suppose a, a test is to ask if your policy is defendable if something goes wrong. Can you say to your bank, to DFAT, to ACNC or any other regulator, donor, beneficiary, media or any other stakeholder, that you have done all that was reasonable in the circumstances? Yes, that's right, Paul. And importantly, your policy should clearly communicate your values and, and the required culture. So remember, we mentioned that most incidents are detected by staff tip-offs. So ideally, the policy should help establish the culture that enables this and clearly sets expectations of the governing body, management, staff, contractors and partners. So drafting the policy gives you an opportunity to address any shortcomings or issues that that you've identified during your preparation process. Um, but it's also important for this to be backed up by action. Um, the policy is your vehicle to communicate and it must be capable of being read and understood by the target audiences, as we've mentioned. So if it can't be read and understood, it's likely to be ineffective. Um, we've talked about having your policy in formal language um, and that might be appropriate for your governance and for major stakeholders. However, it might not be appropriate for other audiences, particularly those overseas. So you might need to translate your policy or maybe present key points of it in images as I mentioned earlier. Um, another important thing is to make sure your policy is signed off by your gut governing body or management, depending on what's appropriate in your organisation. So setting setting that um, zero tolerance for financial wrongdoing culture starts at the top. So their sign off shows that they're serious and they're committed to embedding the culture that's set out in the policy. They should then make the policy live by reinforcing that culture through their actions, by ensuring safe reporting environments, acknowledging and recognising appropriate behaviours and taking action where behaviour is contrary to the policy. So on to the next step on our next slide. In, in the financial wrongdoing policy prevention um, writing guidelines that we've uh, developed that will be published shortly, we've got a, a selection of suggested policy sections. Um, and we think policies should should address the headings um, attached in this slide or similar headings that work for your organisation that, that make sense for your operations and context. So this gives your policy some structure, helps make it easy to follow. Um, it helps if you have a policy that clearly shows your attitude to and intent concerning financial wrongdoing. And it should also communicate an organisational culture, as I mentioned, that will mitigate the risks of financial wrongdoing, where each person can see their roles and responsibilities. If, if the worst happens and you actually do have an incident, the policy should also make clear how it is that people should respond and report. And um, of course, your policy will not be effective if it's just filed away, unseen by anybody. Um, you need to consider how to share it with your users and your stakeholders. Uh, the best approach will depend on the nature of your, of your operations. Your policy or parts of the policy can also be included and communicated in other documents and processes so that they become a natural part of your process. How and what you communicate are also visible sig signals of your culture to your staff, 
into your stakeholders. Yes, that's right, Paul. So some examples of how you might communicate your policy um, for new staff members, you can start explaining it to them when you're doing your recruitment interviews. So say to the say to people when you're interviewing them, we we do police checks of all incoming staff. Do you have a problem with this? And you include um, information about the policy in staff induction, you put it in your code of conduct. You can run tailored training for your staff. Um, some relevant staff might also find it useful to do training provided by DFAT, by the ACNC, by ACFID, and make sure you also do refresher training, of course, don't just do it once. Um, the training should include working through different scenarios and case studies, um, where, and you know you might even have some from your organisation, but of course be a bit careful with confidentiality, of course. Um, include financial wrongdoing as part of uh, checking as part of your partner due diligence and communicate your expectations to partners at the outset of any relationship with them, in, including screening of partners. Um, and you could include financial wrongdoing clauses as part of any contract or partnership agreements that you have with your partner. You can give them a copy of your, your locally tailored prevention of wrongdoing policy at the outset of the relationship. Um, and where it's applicable based on relationships with partners, you could also provide training to their key staff on your policy and expe expectations. Another option that you could do is publish your prevention of financial wrongdoing policy on your website, similar to um, agencies are required to have their child protection policy on their website, um, which gives a really good, powerful message to stakeholders, uh, donors, supporters, regulators, that um, about your stance on financial wrongdoing and its prevention. Yep, and also um, to help better supportive culture for your policy, um, you should also close, look to close the loop on any incidents that have been reported. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, it, you should at least keep the person who reported the incident informed of what you're doing about it. Um, and if appropriate, you can consider uh, sharing desensitised information more widely with stakeholders. Um, you can also report on how your control is operating in practice. And all that really is doing is demonstrating that you're serious about your policy, that you're um, acting your policy out. And um, I suppose you've probably all worked in, in places where the uh, talk is not supported by uh, by action, and you can see how that can bring about, as I think as you mentioned before, apathy and, and probably cynicism. So yeah, very important to, to follow through. And even if you can't provide all the detail to people, at least let them know that you're taking action and that things are happening uh, based on on incidents that they might have reported or, or things that they've um, brought to your attention. Let's move on now to the next slide. Yes, that's yep. right. Yeah, so the, the final step with the policy, which is really, it's not a single step, it, it's an ongoing thing, is to monitor and review the policy. So um, as we've emphasised throughout this session, it's really important that the policy doesn't just sit on a shelf or sit on a server or whatever we say these days. So you need to make sure that it's part of the day-to-day -day operations of the organisation and it's monitored and reviewed. And you might have a set review cycle for, for the policy as well. It's great to take on board any feedback from formal review processes, for example, if you have an internal or external audit, um, and consider any updates that might be required. For example, as Paul mentioned, when you've um, experienced an incident. So sometimes when you do have an incident, you update your procedures, but sometimes it's also required at the policy level. Uh, yep, yeah, that's right, Michelle. Thanks. and. Um... Similarly, you should also have people keeping on top of changes both in the uh, regulatory environment but also in the potential the wrongdoing space because things are always changing out there, especially now with the pace of change increasing all the time. Um, but for example, 20 years ago, um, during this training, we wouldn't be talking about cyber crime or computer crime so much. 
Yes, absolutely. So that's that's the end of our slides where we are talking about how to develop your policy. Um, Paul, I, I believe you've got a bit of a top 10 list of issues that you find when you're reviewing people's policies that come into ACFID. Uh, yes, thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly run through some of the common things that, that uh, we've been seeing. Um, first, what, first up, and quite common, is scope. Um, Often we, the documents don't um, cover all of the elements of financial wrongdoing that are listed in the code. Um, often we'll get a fraud control document. We might get a counter-terrorism control document, but there won't be anything on money laundering. There might be anything on corruption. Um, so to comply with the code, we need all of the, those elements of financial wrongdoing addressed um, via policy statement and by treatments. And that could be in one policy, one document, or you could have separate policies for each, it doesn't matter, as long as they're covered. Um, the other element of scope is that um, who, the, who the, uh, the policies apply to. Um, again, we commonly don't see all parties covered. Um, and one party that's often not covered is the board. Um, so the beautiful policies apply to employees, volunteers, contractors, suppliers, but the board's not mentioned. And of course, that, that should be mentioned. It's been covered by the policies. They're not above all that. And um, we also see sometimes that partners aren't covered. Um, so really to be compliant, we need at least board members, staff, volunteers, contractors, and partners covered by the scope of the policy. Um, we also see, um, I suppose, we talked before about how the treatments of financial wrongdoing are, are sort of covered um, by a lot of different areas in the code um, and covered through a range of different policies and, and procedures. Um, and sometimes they don't all add up or they fight against each other. Um, So one good example, I suppose, is um, quite often we see um, the reporting mechanisms for a, a um, financial wrongdoing policy. Um, the policy will, may um, refer to the whistleblowing policy. So we go look at the whistleblowing policy, which will have a beautiful set of um, how to report an incident and how they're investigated, but then you find the whistleblowing policy only applies to staff of the organisation. It doesn't apply to partners or suppliers or anyone outside of the organisation. So then, then it's deficient and not complying. So I suppose take care that the whole, everything is consistent with each other and they all add up to make the full picture and that they're all, all the bits are consistent all the way through. Um, We also see, um, I suppose, a lack of operation. Opera, opera, let me say that again. A lack of opera, operationalisation of the um, some of the steps, particularly around reporting and investigation. Um, so most policies will say, if you have an incident, here's someone to report it to, and that's often the um, CEO, or might might be the CFO, or might be to report it to, and that's often the um, CEO, or it might, might be the CFO, or it might be the chair, if those people are implicated. Um, but often fall short of saying how to report it. So we'll say who to report to, but there won't be any channel provided. Um, there won't be any email address, phone number, even a postal address. And there, there'll be nothing on the organisation's website either to say how to contact those people. So important to follow through and make go the next step and say um, how is this incident to be actually reported in practice? How does it play out? How would someone from overseas jurisdiction report this incident? Does this channel work? Um, when it comes down to risk, we still see a bit of that wouldn't happen to us, thinking happening, particularly around things like uh, money laundering and uh, probably to a lesser extent, terrorism financing. Um, so we don't see um, 
we don't see those elements covered in people's risks assess risk assessments and then they don't really follow through then manifest themselves into a, into a robust policy around those areas as well. Um, and often there we see a bit of cutting and pasting happening and um, it sort of becomes apparent that things have been thought through and strategies aren't in place or aren't appropriate for that organisation. Um, so really, really important to get the, that upfront thinking um, done and the risk assessment sorted out to be a good foundation for going ahead and developing your policies and your treatments against those risks. Um, and then it's just about how you report um, things to, to funders and stakeholders holders and that sort of thing. Um, and that's sort of often a neglected um, area. Just again, it's just around closing that loop and making sure everybody's um, there's mechanisms there to keep everybody in the picture. Um, having channels to get back the funders, particularly if there's inc incidents that have occurred that you need to keep them on board. Um, and also, probably just as important to communicate that there hasn't been anything happening to worry about. Um, and that all your processes are working. Um, as like I said, none, none of this stuff's foolproof and things do get through, but as I mentioned before, if you've got um, all the processes and policies in place, you've got defence then um, that you've taken all reasonable steps and done all that could be expected of you. Um, yeah, look, Michelle, I think I'll leave it at that. I think that's enough on those things. Um, but there are just some things to keep in mind when you're preparing your policies and um, hopefully gives you some insight into some of the things that we see and some of the things that we look for here in Oxford when we go through your Thanks documentation. A great summary. Now, I'm aware that we're pretty much on time. Now, we've got a couple of quick slides we'll go to just looking at resources. There's heaps of resources out there to help you with developing a policy and having um, templates for procedures and all of that sort of thing. So we've we've kind of got a, a bit of a highlights list of those here in the slides and um, we've certainly collated a whole heap of those in the guidelines that ACFID is about to publish. Um, and Paul, I think you wanted to talk a bit about uh, Charity Fraud Awareness Week coming up as well. Uh, yeah, this is just a quick one. Um, so there's not a UK organisation that's running Charity Fraud Awareness Week, which would be next week. Um, so just probably have a look on the ACNC side, I think, they're the ones that are sponsoring that um, here in Australia. Um, so I think there's a series, I'm not entirely sure actually having said that now, exactly what I've got proposed. Um, we've got, I think there's um, some webinars happening as well um, and some other resources that will be going up um, not just for our sector, but for the whole wider charity sector. Um, but yeah, look, check it out on the website. Um, and also there's a, the other link there is to the Fraud Advisory Panel in the UK, which again are, are running that, the organisation is running the Charity Fraud Awareness Week, so there'll be further information up there as well. Um, and of course, we have mentioned our guidelines for the development of a prevention of financial wrongdoing policy, which is coming soon. And what do we mean by soon? Hopefully within the next month or so. Um, we've, uh, it's currently just with our web designers at the moment. Um, the guidelines will be uh, published on an online format, which hopefully will be, should be easy to navigate. So what we're trying to do is um, um, make them easy, easy to use so you can navigate through the documents and click on the areas that you need um, to interact with, which will then um, expand out to give you the guidance, hopefully, that you're after. And um, also, we've um, loaded up the guidance with a number of tips and examples that we hope you will find useful um, for developing your uh, provincial, prevention of financial wrongdoing policies. Um, but yeah, look out for that. We'll certainly get some communication out around that um, when those um, guidelines go up. 
Um, but yeah, have a look at just keep checking out our website as well. But also, um, I should point out that um, this webinar is part part of our um, focus on the code series of events that we are running regularly, probably once every three months. And um, this this period, it's all about quality principle eight, which includes, as we mentioned before, um, financial wrongdoing and all the other reporting and um, managing resources type uh, requirements of the code. Um, so again, have a look on our website. Um, there's a bit of a blog up there and some videos and other resources um, that um, hopefully you'll find interesting and hopefully we'll make the subject of uh, financial management and um, control entertaining. Um, questions? I can see we've got Sorry, one question, which I had there, two questions. Um, yes, so Jan, you've asked, you've mentioned that um, you have a range of documents, 15 policies, um, and you've asked whether any of these, these all need to be uh, conflated into one prevention of financial wrongdoing policy. The answer to that is no, they don't. Um, it's quite okay to have um, more than one policy, it's just whatever works for your organisation, whatever makes sense. For some um, small organisations, they might be able to cover off um, all the financial wrongdoing in one document. Um, other organisations, it might not make much sense. Typically, we would see um, um, policies broken up into a fraud policy. You might, you might have fraud and corruption wrapped up in one. You might have a, um, a um, counter-terrorism Financing policy, um, money laundering, um, that might be another one or that might be wrapped up in fraud. Just depends, whatever makes sense. Um, and part of that too is, it's, I suppose, it's what controls have got in place around each of those things. And um, the controls for each of those types of financial wrongdoing might be a bit different for, for each type of wrongdoing. So that might mean you might need a different document um, to support to um, to um, outline your policy on each of those areas. Um, otherwise, combining them becomes a bit messy and a bit unclear. But yeah, it's whatever works. So there's not not really any any um, any real rule there. Um, so if you need to, as part of the compliance, to send in 15 policies to us here in Eckford to look at, um, that's what you can do. And I can tell you, some people have done that. Um, next question from Jane again. Uh, will it not be possible? For, oh, sorry, if I jump down too far. <laughs> that, that looks to me, Paul, like a question to take offline. Uh, yep. Yeah. Are there any other questions from people? I, I realise we're a little over time, sorry. so we'll, we'll try and wrap up. Any? Does anyone else have any other questions? So if not, as Paul mentioned... But Jen, I'll, I'll get back to you on another question yeah. too. Yep. Yeah, oh, Sorry, as Michelle. Paul mentioned, if there's any other questions, you can send it through to the code code mailbox, which is code at acfid.asn.au. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, now, please complete a quick survey and let us have um, let us have your feedback. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, everyone.